You joined the IRA in 1953 and you joined the British Army in 1954. That was a quick change, wasn't it? Did you not like it? <laughs> <laughs> well, it was a question of, I was uh, more or less, the IRA headquarters asked me to take on the task of joining the British Army and securing information concerning golf barracks in Armagh at the time. So I said, yes, certainly. Did you take the shilling? Did they offer you a shilling in those days? No, I don't, they didn't offer me a shilling, but I mean, that. Uh, I took the oath, uh-huh. uh, of course that was necessary you know, to demonstrate your loyalty and commitment to the Queen. And how long did you spend in the army? You must have been one of the shortest recruits of all uh, time, you know, you, you should be in the Guinness Book of Records. Uh, I think it was about six months I spent about, uh, you see, when, when I joined about April 1954, you walked up to the barrack gate and you were just said you wanted to join and they brought you in. They were very happy to see you. So uh, I was waiting then for an intake of recruits to start training. So I was able to spend some time moving around the barracks, more or less as a free agent, and you're getting your bed and board. So that, like, uh, when the IRA uh, decided to raid the barracks for the arms in June of the 12th, 1954, by then I had... Spent about two and a half, two months or more in the barracks and was well aware of the you know, security arrangements. Were you in Armagh Barracks? Armagh Barracks, yes, I. That's the one. And how did you know you were going to be sent there? I suppose it didn't matter what, oh, no, you? That's where I signed up. The golf Barracks in Armagh was the kind of home base for the Irish, the Royal Irish Fusiliers, which was the regiment that I joined. And that the area had selected golf Barracks because... A chap named Leo McCormick, who had been an IRA training officer, had noticed sometime previously in the early 54 that this barracks was guarded by soldiers with, who had weapons with no rounds in the weapons. So that, like, there was a kind of a, there was a lapse, you know, a kind of a gap which could be exploited. So by being in there, I was able to ascertain where the arms were kept at certain times, where they were being, uh, you know, uh, how it was possible to get into the armory and then uh, clean it out, which they did. Were you there on the day when that happened? Yeah, I was on. I was uh, in the barracks. I knew it was happening. So I looked out of the barrack window and, and I seen this big red lorry across the, at the armory. And I knew that it was happening then. So I just uh, lay down on the bed and hoped everything would go okay. So uh, they got out all right and they were well away when the alarm was raised. All that evening there was a big scurrying here and there to and fro as to where the raiders were and uh, how they were to be captured and so on. But at that time everyone was well away and uh, secure as, as were the arms. Did any of them realise that it was an inside job? Well, I think that obviously they must have had guessed that there was some inside information. But uh, I think that uh, the, uh, I mean, the special branch came in to question all the personnel in the barracks some time after the raid. And uh, I mean, they were asking the questions such as, you know, do you know anybody in the IRA? Well, like, you weren't going to say you did. You know, for, for that, that was the kind of questions that they were asking. So then uh, I finished the recruits training then, perhaps about July, and then I came back down to Dublin and uh, more or less met with IRA headquarters and discussed what was next. So the, the regiment was going to go to Kenya to fight the Mau Mau. So I went back after more or less seven days leave after recruit training, and we went to Ballykindler Barracks. So the idea was that, like, to try and find out what the situation was in these other places. But Ballykinna was a different kettle of fish to Armagh barracks. And then it was fairly lackadaisical at the same time because they, they were getting ready to go to Kenya, say, to fight the Mau Mau. Well, I had no intentions of fighting the Mau Mau. And then uh, we were given then a week's leave about sometime in October before we embarked for Kenya. So when I came back down to Dublin then, 
and the IRA were planning the raid on Omar Barracks at that time. And uh, we had a man in Omar Barracks, but they asked me to go into Omar Barracks as I was still in the British Army and just to confirm some of the information that he had got. So I went into Omar Barracks and I went up to the gate, knocked on the gate and said that I was a serving British soldier. I wanted to kind of keep up for the night. So they brought me in and I was able to go to the canteen. I met her own man in there at the time. I stayed overnight and then just confirmed with him some details and left the next morning. That was my end of my British Army career. And did they ever write and ask you why you left so fast, no? No, no. I never had any contact with them after that, no. no. Then the Omar raid took place then sometime middle of October, maybe late October. And then it wasn't it was a failure that like, you know, eight men captured and given long jail sentences. Was it Armagh where you changed the century? That's right, yes, I yes. It was Armagh where the the IRA took over the the sentry's position at the at the gate. And, and what had to do with the sentry? Well I mean there was a the kind of a inside the gate there was this kind of a guard house and any soldiers that were on guard duty would be resting there or anybody coming in would go to the guard house uh, to get information. So the area took over the guard house and kept prisoners there. That's where the sentry was held as a prisoner. While the balance with the rest of the uh, members of the area went to the armory, which is about 100 yards in off the road. 